All right, everybody, let's get started. Panelists, if you may. <laughs> Too kind. All right. Yeah. Well, first off, introductions. I'm Alfonso Calderon. I'm 16, and I I go to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Do you like men? Introduce yourself. And I am Quinlan Patel, and I go to a late the East High School here in the Kansas City area, and I am 15, going to be a sophomore. Just to say, if anyone that needs ALS uh, signing, we have a signer here, and if you need it, you can sit right in the front row so you're able to see it easiest, as well as disabled seating, which is also right in the front row. Um, and then we're also going to have a question part for you guys, where we will be passing around note cards and pens so you guys can fill out your own questions uh, for us to ask the panelists. So yeah. If you would like a note card and a pen, just raise your hand right now and you'll be able to write down your question. Raise your hand again, someone will come pick it up. All right, great. Uh, as much as I love the energy in this room right now, I feel like there's one thing that we do have to do before we start. I think we should start with a moment of silence for the two fallen officers that just, just died recently. They were Deputy Patrick Rower and Deputy, Deputy Therese, Ter, Teresa King. I'm so, so sorry. Uh, I think a moment of silence is appropriate, so let us. All right, thank you everybody. Thank you for your patience. Just <laughs> also a really big thanks to uh, Captain Grosco for keeping us safe and making sure this event goes the way it's supposed to be. Absolutely. All right. So before we ask any of the formal questions, I think every panelist should introduce themselves in about 10 seconds. Name, age, school. You guys know what to do. Hello, everyone. My name is Trevon Bosley. Uh, I'm from Chicago, Illinois, and I attend Southern Illinois Ellwoodsville University. Hello, everyone. My name is Ariana Williams. I am from Chicago, Illinois, and I attend Michigan State University. Hello, I'm Anthony Lovelace, and I attend Roosevelt University. I'm from Chicago. Hi, everyone. My name is April Ma. I'm 17. I'm attending Blue Valley West High School in the Kansas City area. Good afternoon, Kansas City. My name is Taylor Mills. I am 17 years old, and I am a rising senior at Blue Valley North High School. My name is Rachel Gonzalez. I'm 19 years old, and I am a rising sophomore at Missouri Western State University. Uh, my name is Ryan Deitch. I'm 18 years old, and I'm a recent graduate of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Good evening. My name is Cameron Kasky. I am 17 years old, and I am a I am a rising senior at Stoneman Douglas High School. Hi, my name is Kyra Simon. I'm 17. I'm a rising senior at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? I go by the name Lyric Smith. Um, I'm a student at Forest Park Community College, and I'm a fashion designer.
All right, awesome. Now you've met your panelists. Really briefly, before we start, we have a merch stand outside and all the proceeds are going to a local charity called Aim for Peace. So if you do want to donate, you can get a really cool shirt as well. In the design, you'll see that we have a QR code and the American flag. The QR code, if you scan it in all 38 states with automatic re voter registration, you will be taken to a link online to register to vote if you haven't already. And real quick, as we promised, more seating is available to everybody else who came. We don't want to make you all stand. And we are so thankful that we have this support tonight that we have too many people for this one room. We are Thank literally you. opening the wall, so. And one last thing, if you enjoy what you saw tonight and you're interested in causing change in your community in whichever way you want to, please text CHANGE to 9779. 9779, three sevens. Three sevens, two nines, you know what's up. All right, now we commence. Quinn? Okay, I'll be starting with the first question. Just let me pull up real fast. <laughs> um, in 2016 alone, there are 383 murders in the Kansas state alone due to firearms. According to the CDC, of course. Um, what efforts have you been taking to combat this ec epidemic? And this is uh, located towards the Kansas residents. So take a lead. Two of you answer at, for one question. Um, well, um, I am from Kansas City, Kansas, more specifically, Overland Park. Um, and one thing that we do know that Kansas City is one of the most murderous cities um, in the country. And this has got to change. You know, gun violence is gun violence no matter what. Um, one thing that we have been trying to do and we really have acknowledged is that Kansas has some of the most lax gun laws in America. I think it's 48 out of 50 according to the Giffords report. But um, one thing that we really want to change is gun safety. Providing gun locks to parents, um, making sure that kids at home are, do not have easy access to these guns because that can cause accidents and that can cause injury or death. Another thing is um, ensuring that we know where these guns are, meaning that we open up a gun registration. In Kansas, that is actually not required by law, and we want to change that. Um, call your representatives, call your senators, tell them that you want this change so we know who exactly has guns in, in our counties and in our cities, so we know that if someone breaks a law or if someone is deemed dangerous, we can take that away from them before someone is injured or killed. Um, something I personally uh, am going to start definitely advocating for is something that I learned about called red flag laws. So a couple states have already pursued these types of laws. What happens is that if someone is exhibiting concerning behavior, um, you can report that to a police officer or a judge. And if deemed a, a considerable threat, that person can have their firearms taken away from them until they're actually deemed safe to own them again. Um, I think this is reasonable because the problem with gun violence in America is that dangerous people are acquiring guns. So being able to prevent dangerous people from acquiring guns and then giving them back to them when they're deemed safe citizens is really important. So that's something I'm dedicated to pursuing in the future, which is called red flag laws. You can look it up for more information. My name is Rachel. I'm also from Kansas City, but on the Missouri side. Um, and I, one thing that I wanted to mention that um, Taylor and April did not mention is that they are starting a Students Demand Action organization here in Kansas City, and people can get involved, and that's one way that they are working to help this, or, uh, this epidemic in Kansas City, and I think that we should give them a round of applause because that's amazing. Text students to 64433. Students, 64433. Thanks. All right. So the next question is directed to my people from Parkland. Hey, Cam. Hi. So this summer you're traveling across the country talking to real Americans about some real issues regarding guns. Everywhere across the country, people view guns differently. The way people see guns in New York is not the same way people see guns in Kansas. So what policies do you think everybody could get behind to save lives. And not only that, how are you dealing with people with different, differenting ideals? 
Well, first of all, I'd like to say that most of what we've learned in our, in our journey and, and par as part of this movement is that you can learn so much more from the people who disagree with you than you can from the people who agree with you. You can't just surround yourself in an echo chamber with people who will applaud your every word, then you become the President of the United States. I believe that a lot of people in this country, whether it be those advocating for stronger gun laws or the responsible gun owners in this country who do not believe the gun laws need to be changed, can support the following things. I think we need an expansion of universal background checks in private sales. I think that anybody who is a lawful gun owner should be all about private sales having background checks because if you are a law-abiding citizen purchasing a weapon, you should be perfectly willing to go through a background check. There are several states in this country where domestic abusers are allowed to buy weapons, and yet many of these gun crimes you'll see are from people who have been domestic abusers before. That is something we can change, and again, if you are a law-abiding citizen, there's no problem with that on your end. Another thing that I think a lot of people can look into is the funding of CDC research into gun violence as a health issue in this country. <laughs> Only recently, was the CDC allowed to even research gun violence as a health issue in this country? But there's no funding yet. We need to make sure the CDC gets funding because in, in recent history, 80% of the gun deaths you'll see in the world have been in the United States. That's a health epidemic. Another uh, few more things we can look into are the digitalization of ATF files. There are many states in which weapons from crime scenes cannot be traced back to the owner with anything but a paper trail. There have been several cities where the digitalization of ATF files have proven to trace guns back to their owners that have been used in crimes more efficiently, and I see no reason for this not to be Im implemented everywhere. On our website, marchforlives.com, there are 10 policy points, like the ones I just mentioned, that will actively save lives and have actively saved lives if you look at the statistics in those states where they have been implemented. Does anyone else want to answer that question? He, he covered it. <laughs> if he covered it, he covered it. There are plenty more policy points. I, I didn't want to read 10 to everybody. Please feel free to look them up. And if you, uh, after this, if you want to discuss them with me, I'm happy to. So it was Kyra and Ryan and everybody. Okay. Um, the next question will be directed towards those Chicago residents with us. Uh, when most politicians talk about gun violence in Chicago, they talk about with gangs. What's it really like and what's your experience with that? Um, well, first off, thanks for welcoming us, Kansas City. We feel, all of us feel that home. It's true of our hospitality, I must say. Um, but I, as, I, as I said earlier, um, as I was speaking in Naperville, Illinois, a lot of times what we do to label um, gun deaths in urban areas are uh, we call Latino. When is Latino involved, we say it's an illegal immigrant involved. When it's a white person involved, we say it's a mental health issue. When it's a black person involved, we say it's a gang issue. That kind of, and that when they do that, it trains us to say like, oh, well, it's justified then. It, this is why they're doing this. But I want, I want you guys to look back and look deeper into why these communities have gangs. When you have communities that are raped of resources, and raped of things to do, and you have one side of one street and one avenue, rich and affluent, and you have another one wondering if they're gonna eat tonight, you figure out why these communities have gangs. Every community has gangs, they just call it different things. It may be the rec team, or it may be a police department. Every, th every neighborhood has a band of people that are together. Na gangs are blocks, right? You find gangs on blocks. They are a bunch of people who come together for the betterment of our blocks. But when you don't give them jobs and resources, they turn to the illegal market for their, um, for their money. And who has kids in here? Raise your hands. Y'all kids gonna eat tonight, right? No matter if you don't eat, you gonna make sure there's something on your kid's plate. So we can't blame these gang members for being in gangs and doing illegal activities if we can't give them real things to do. It is unfair and unjust. Yeah, you can answer. Oh, all right, well, if he got it, he got it. Wow, we got some good panelists tonight. So the next question is actually for the residents from Kansas. Uh, your governor recently passed in April a measure to keep guns out of the hands of domestic abusers, a step that Cameron mentioned. 
He mentions a lot of things, by the way. <laughs> but that, that was a tangible step to attempting to save lives in your own home state of Kansas. Your governor is also a Republican. Republicans are stereotyped to be against all forms of you know, gun violence preventative measures. What have you found to be true in your own state? And also, why do you think that Republicans generally do not agree with these preventative measures? Well, the first thing I want to clarify is that the reason why I am with this movement is because I want to see policy change and not party change. Because I don't think party affiliation is important. I think as long as we see change, as long as we see lives safe, that's good enough for me. Um, in terms of what do I see, uh, what, what do I think about Republicans being associated with the NRA, I think that is a really unfortunate stereotype because there are some Republicans who genuinely want to see good change, who want to save lives. And I think that's something that we fail to recognize sometimes. Um, so when it comes to associating with the NRA, we really need Republicans on our side that show that they are for common sense gun, uh, gun legislation. We're trying to protect the lives of our children, we're trying to protect the lives of our future generations, and we can't do that if we're divided by party lines. Um, we've said this before and we'll, re we'll reiterate the entire night. This is a bipartisan issue. This is a human issue. This is about our lives. You can't put a party on that and it's, it's impossible. Um, so, you know, the, as great as the domestic abuser was, we're still playing a defensive game in terms of gun safety um, regulations in this state. And, um, you know, we still need to pass those um, restricted regulations. We still need to pass the universal background check system. We need to close that gun show loophole. We need to have psych evaluations when people buy guns. There's still so many steps that we have to take. And Ryan has said this before, this is a marathon, you know, and we have to keep at it. Um, and we have to realize that compromise is key in this issue. Um, as it still is on the hot topic and it will be in the November election so you know stay informed know your representative know what they're voting for and if they really are on your side don't just look at their the Democratic or Republican Party that they have on their name look at what they're actually doing in office I'm on the Missouri side but um, I also don't have the world's greatest governor um, I actually have a new governor, um, but I, I do agree that we need to look at the who's getting money from the NRA, whether it be a Democrat or Republican, but I wanted to mention that in this district, Kansas 03, Kevin Yoder has received thousands of dollars from the NRA, so we should vote him out. That's a valid point, Rachel. But um, I'd like to say, <laughs> uh, Mayor Sly James has actually just arrived here, and we really, really want him to tell the issue of gun violence at Portland Center. He does a lot of good for Now, uh, I just lost it. Uh, this next question is for those from St. Louis. Everyone saw how gun violence affected uh, Ferguson, Missouri after the death of Michael Brown. How does gun violence affect the greater area of St. Louis? Great question. Um, personally for me, it was, uh, hit home uh, after the situation occurred and it happened uh, because actually my, Michael Brown, uh, he was from Pine Line and that's um, the district where I'm actually uh, currently living in. So it hit home uh, for me, uh, but I believe um, just being around the people after the incident was like it opened the minds of a lot of people and educated people because we often, you know, just associated with um, our gun violence with gang activity, our drive-bys, and you have like the nine-year-old Jamila who got killed in her home in bed with her mother, nine years old. Um, that wasn't even on the news. We had to learn about that from her family and from Facebook, but it didn't get on the news until later when we went viral and people started saying, well, this was gang activities. And so for us um, in St. Louis, what we're trying to do is trying to say, well, 
gang activity still is gun violence. And what we're trying to communicate to the neighborhood is like, we have to go out and educate ourselves. We have to rally up and think about the people that we love or that we claim that we love, our family members, our next door neighbors. And so um, for St. Louis, it's been very burdensome after the incident. But what we're trying to do is just communicate to the younger people that you have a voice use it. You know, it's beautiful uh, to use your voice. You may feel like you're not heard at times, but that's okay because if one person, even out of this room, listens to you, that's enough. You know, it's worth the time to speak up and speak your truths. And so that's what we're trying to communicate to the younger youth. And um, yeah. All right. This next question is for the people from Parkland. Uh, the NRA, or National Rifle Association, has been a big focus for this movement. What exactly is the NRA doing that is stopping these gun violence preventative measures that you are for? Well, I, I mean, the, the National Rifle Association, uh, they... For, for, so, for so long, they, they have been this group that has been very helpful in teaching people proper gun ownership, uh, responsible gun ownership, and just very well how to use a rifle, a handgun, any sort of firearm. And for that, that's amazing. We need that in our society because our laws do not reflect that. And when our laws try to reflect that, in recent years, the National Rifle Association has gone against that. They have gone against various measures like uh, safe gun storage laws and various things like uh, they have gone for uh, concealed carry reciprocity, which I know on paper sounds very good. But when you look into it, around the third paragraph of concealed carry reciprocity, they have a provision that says you are allowed to open carry in school zones, which last time I checked is not a very safe thing. It is not a very responsible thing for anybody to be touting a firearm in that sort of situation. Just show of hands, I'm not sure if a lot of people in here, if this will affect everyone. Did, it, did anybody in here, probably people over the age of 30, get their NRA sharpshooter certificate at some point? Great. My father did, back when the NRA was a group of plain clothes, average Joe Americans who were trying to defend the Second Amendment. The NRA claims that my friends and I are attacking the Second Amendment. I have guns in my home. The guns in my home are safely stored. My father is a, is a reserve police officer. They are in a safe, locked up. I have no idea where the key is. I don't need to know. I feel safer with those few firearms in my house. The NRA lately has not been about defending the Second Amendment. The NRA, ever since they started getting kickbacks from the gun manufacturers, are trying to sell guns and intimidate Americans, scare Americans. into thinking that they need these weapons to defend themselves from the, red coats, from the red coats and bears that were running around back when the Second Amendment was written. There are restrictions on the Second Amendment. Does anybody here know of the NFA of 1934 or 36 that says that we cannot walk around the streets with RPGs, grenades, and Tommy guns? Times have changed. Uh, accommodations should be available and made for the hunters of this country who have guns as part of their lifestyle. But we need to look at our laws and say, do we need these weapons to help these people live the lives that they have? Or can we restrict these weapons so people like those in my school are not massacred? 17 people in six minutes. Everyone here knows what they're talking about pretty well, as I've seen. It's only taken one person to answer each question when we've regulated two. Uh, well do you regulated think, panel, guys. Yeah, well regulated panel. Uh, <laughs> Second <laughs> Amendment joke, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, this is uh, towards the Chicago residents again. Uh, do you think the funding quality issue for the public schools of Chicago is related to the gun violence in those areas? 241 people in Chicago have been shot and killed. 147 um, people, 21 and under, um, of that number were shot and killed. So we have children being shot and killed on our streets. 
these children should be worried about when their next um, homework assignment is due or if they're qualified to take um, gym this year or if they'll take it at all because it's so hard. Um, <laughs> but, in, but in fact, we're always worried about um, walking alone in the streets trying to get home because our school has cut after school activities because we no longer have anything to do after school. So we don't want to go home because teenagers in the house, what? Unless we're, not, unless we're playing a game. Um, it's hot outside. We want to go outside and be with our friends. <laughs> we, want to, we want to enjoy our summer. Um, like me, I want to enjoy my summer before I have to go off to college. But I can no longer do that because when the temperature rises, more people come outside, more people stand on the corners. So you not only become a target, but these people are a target. That's why my mom always tells me not to stand in the crowd on the corner because bullets do not have name, names on them. So any one of you could be shot and they could be trying to hit the other person but they accidentally, accidentally hit you. Last year, I had three AP classes. I had a 4.8 GPA. <laughs> This year, um, well, this, it was this year, actually, but um, it was the first semester. So second semester, they told us that we will no longer have these AP classes because they can no longer pay for the teachers. So my GPA was a 4.0, I mean, 4.8 the first semester, and then it dropped to like a 4.5-ish. Yeah. <laughs> so those credits that I earned from AP Chemistry, AP Government, and AP um, Literature and Composition were gone. Um, to piggyback off that, uh, I want people to understand that in Chicago, it's elementary schools in our south and west sides, predominantly black and brown communities, that in their history book, the last president is George W. Bush, first term. So the book ends with um, fighting terrorism and how the country moves forward. So when you have situations like that and you have standardized testing in our schools, you're, tell you're giving us kids like way less resources than other kids have. So when you say, hey, go test, in, me and Trey were privileged enough to go to a selective enrollment school, top, some of the top schools in the city, but then when you tell kids who have history books outdated and resources outdated to, hey, so say, hey, go to a good school, go to a good college, go find a good job, that is unacceptable. And I've learned on this tour that it's not just Chicago. It's St. Louis, it's, part, it's Ferguson, it's parts of Kansas City, it's parts of everywhere you look in the country, and we cannot tolerate it. <laughs> so, my beautiful friend and my roommate for tonight asked me where the money is going in Chicago. Our mayor has used the unfortunate death of Commander Paul Bauer to build a $95 million police academy while closing three neighborhood schools in Inglewood, one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the city. So I want you guys to understand that Chicago and other neighborhoods, I mean other cities, Baltimore, New York, New Orleans, Compton, all, all these places suffer from very similar things and have very similar results. We cannot keep doing the same thing and get, keep getting the same results and then asking ourselves, well, how, how come it's so violent in these neighborhoods? We understand the problem. It's time for us as Americans to stand up and say, no matter what happens, we cannot tolerate it. All right. The next question is for the residents from Kansas. So you guys are pretty much interested in creating change and really moving this conversation forward. What have been your biggest obstacles in this conversation and on this issue? Um, I mean, I think probably one of the biggest thing is opening up conversations. Um, we are a pretty conservative stronghold state and the gun culture is deeply ingrained into our daily lives. Um, my father is a gun owner, um, my neighbors are, and bringing up the idea of gun violence prevention, it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of scary. And um, they are intimidated by the fact that they think that we're trying to take away their Second Amendment right, um, that we're coming after their guns. But in reality, that's not true at all. What we want to do is we want to save lives. We want to make Kansas City a place where people want to come to because we don't want them to be afraid that their children are going to die. Um, and that's really kind of been like the biggest struggle is kind of going over that hump of 
ignorance towards the actual um, situation itself. Um, so I really encourage you guys, you know, have those difficult conversations with your neighbors, your kids. Have those conversations with people you disagree with. That's when you learn the most about an issue, when you know both sides of it. Um, so truly branch out, you know, it's kind of scary at first, but you get down to it, we all really want the same thing, which is to save lives. So. I completely agree with Taylor. I think the biggest uh, problem, this is true of all cities, not just Kansas City, is communication. We are trying to communicate with you all the time as a movement. We are telling you we want to keep you safe. We want to save lives. We want to keep your children safe. We want to make sure your kids have a peaceful uh, life, that there are no tragedies that happen in their schools, their nurseries, their churches, nothing like that. And the issue with communication is, is that people get defensive immediately. And the reason why, um, well, I know a lot of people, or some people here tonight, don't necessarily agree with the message of the movement. And I think it's because you're receiving that message incorrectly. We're not here to, uh, we're not here to take away your guns. We're not here to take away your rights. We're not here to tell you to do something. We're not here to force something away from you. We want you to understand that this is a real issue. And if we don't identify the real problem and solve, or go about solving that problem, we are never going to truly uh, experience change. My name is Rachel, again, I'm on the Missouri side, but I think that one of the obstacles that each and every one of us on this panel right now have faced in this movement is the people who think that we're not old enough to have a voice. And I wanted to tell you that that is untrue. Even if you are not old enough to vote, you are still old enough to get involved with this movement, still old enough to talk to your neighbors and get your parents to vote, and um, definitely your voice is important no matter your age. I'd just like to say great job to everyone on the panel so far. You've all had very intelligent answers. Um, and then uh, my next question is directed towards the Parkland students. Um, when people say the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun, what do you say to that? How do you respond? Well, I know a lot of people who thought they were going to be good guys with guns. Um, there are a lot of gun owners in my family. I was at the gun range for the first time when I was eight years old. I, I didn't know there was a drawback and I was holding the gun very close to my face and it hit me in the nose. It was embarrassing, my father laughed. Um, the good guy with the gun argument is, is very interesting because a lot of the good guys with the guns have not been there to stop the bad guys with the guns. And a lot of the good guys with the guns have turned into bad guys with guns. A lot of the good guys with the guns have let their children get their guns, accidentally discharge them, and not only hurt themselves or others, but they might lose their children in that, in that fire. I believe that that argument is, is very invalid. I think on paper it's, it's amazing. I think on paper a lot of things are amazing. But when you really apply it, uh, if, if you're, if, uh, the, the good guy with the gun stopping a bad guy with the gun rhetoric only extends as far as how easy it is for the bad guys to get these weapons. I just want to say thank you to everyone for coming out. There's so many of you here. Yes. All right, the good guy versus the bad guy with a gun argument is extremely flawed. Adding more guns and weapons into the situation only makes it worse and only offers more carnage. And there's also so many fallacies. There's so many things that could go wrong in that situation. The good guy with the gun may not be able to save the day. There's so many situations where there's mass shootings, gun violence every day where someone adds a gun into a situation. It only furthers the carnage, only furthers the hurt, the pain, the suffering. So I feel that argument is extremely flawed and we should look for a more logical, responsible way of addressing that. Uh, so, sorry, I just want to share something that was uh, shared with me from the uh, a ACLU. Uh, breaking the court rules that Kansas's documentary proof of citizenship law, which disenfranchised thousands of eligible voters, violates the National Voter Registration Act. Yeah. It has been permanently 
shotgun. I didn't have to explain that. I had, uh, somebody had to explain that law to me like eight minutes ago. <laughs> um, one thing that I just want to touch on this real quick. Kansans, listen up. There is a reason why that law was trying to be implemented because they're afraid of your vote. Your vote matters. They wouldn't try to take away if it did not your vote scares them because they know that you're going to vote them out. And I'm looking at all my youth in here. If you're between the ages of 18 to 24, raise your hand. You all should be registered. You all should be registered right now, and you should go to the polls. If you turn 18 before the election, you can pre-register, so do it. All right, sorry. Us talking over each other must be really difficult for the interpreter. Everybody give a round of applause for the interpreter. <laughs> All right, before our next question, I just wanted to say, man, it's awesome that we're in Kansas today. Like, this place rocks. I'm gonna be honest. The barbecue is unreal, so I'm All right, well, my next question is directed to my Chicago family. Yes, we're family now. Yeah. We might look different, but we're all still people. <laughs> all right, so I know for, for the Parkland students and for the Kansas City students, They've talked a lot about the NRA and how the NRA has kind of been in the way of, you know, gun, prevent, like gun violence preventative measures that they wanted to implement. Has the NRA affected you in any way, shape, or form in Chicago? And if so, how? Uh, hello? hello? Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Mic check? I'm a bad one. I know it was. Um, well, as far as the NRA um, affecting Chicago and affecting some of our politicians, um, they are affecting some of our initiatives that we try to get done as well as our funding for different programs that we have in Chicago. So I know for a fact that the NRA has a huge problem with a man named Father Michael Flager who is in Chicago who is actively just trying to counteract the gun violence in the city. And they constantly try to um, deter him at every turn. They try to spread rumors about him. They try to uh, stop his initiatives, as well as they like to try to cut fundings for other programs within the city, and they like to fight for that. So as far as them having an effect, yes, they play a part. I also want to add on top of that that Chicago, ironically, has some of the strongest gun laws in the country. But the NRAs, they're not stupid. They may seem stupid at times, and what they say may be stupid to us, some of us, um, but they're not stupid. So what they do is they know Chicago's a super liberal place, but they go outside of Chicago and they lobby and they feed the, their politicians money. For example, I live 20 minutes from Indiana. I know for a fact some of my friends have bought guns from people who've drove to Indiana, bought guns for bulk at a gun show, and sold them for double in Illinois. So if you're ever wondering, like, well, yeah, Chicago has some strong gun laws. The NRA puts pressure on outside places that feed guns into our communities. So don't ever be fooled. Strong gun laws only work when it's universal. That's why it's important to vote in federal elections. That's why it's important to vote for federal, uh, federal elections. That's why it's important to vote for your senators, and that's why it's really important, just that case coming up, to know the federal judges that, you're, that they're going to appoint and that, you're can vote, that you can vote for. I know for a fact, sometimes I'll vote when there's so many judges, I'm like, uh, I don't know, I like this name. But it's important for us to be well-informed voters, not just voting, but well-informed, knowing it. And on top of that, I know I'm, I'm kind of everywhere, but if a politician takes any dime from a large corporation like the NRA, it is proven that they will not represent us. Stop voting for people taking large monies from large corporations. It is proven that they are not for us. So stop giving them your vote. Also, also they brought an armored car to the Peace March and did a buy, sell, trade guns thing at the Peace March. It didn't work, though. It didn't work. They got kicked out work. by the police. It did not work. Chicago has strict gun laws, so selling guns in the street is illegal. <laughs> Next question. 
Okay, uh, this is directed towards my fellow Kansans that I know pretty well, I'd like to say. Um, what strategies have you found effective uh, when you're talking to someone that doesn't quite support what you're talking about, like common sense gun legislation? Yeah, so one thing I found really useful is that when you're talking to someone who doesn't necessarily agree with you, um, it's important to think about what kind of communication you're using. So that, for me, that's phrasing. Um, for people who back the NRA, who support the NRA, when you say gun control or gun reform, they are immediately turned off. So something, that, uh, as Taylor was talking about before, when you're having these hard discussions with your family um, that disagree with you, especially about gun violence prevention, you want to use that phrase, gun violence prevention, because it's exactly what you're doing. You're preventing gun violence. You're saving lives. We're, again, I'm going to repeat it, but we're not taking away anything from you. We're giving other people the opportunity to live a safer, peaceful life. And when you, when you talk to people like that, that's how you get them to open up. That's how you get them to be on your side. said before, you know, the gun culture is deeply ingrained into America. So, you know, and guns do have a useful purpose. Um, they can be used for self-defense reasonably. So my recommendation is be empathetic. See it from their side. See it from, you know, why they have a gun in their home or why they are such a gun advocate and, you know, use that. Um, in your argument. Also, you know, bring up the other rights in our Constitution. Think about, you know, that every single right in the Constitution has limitations, really except for the Second Amendment. You know, my First Amendment right has limitations within schools, and so the Second Amendment should have reasonable limitations as well. So if you come at it like that angle, that also works too, I found. So, yeah. <laughs> Again, I'm, I'm from Missouri. I'm on the Kansas City, Missouri side, but um, we know. I want you to um, raise your hand if you don't support this movement. Do we have anybody in here? <laughs> it's okay. We don't bite. We don't discriminate. We won't bite. We won't Come bite. On. Do we have anybody okay. in here that doesn't support this? There we go. There's one. We have There's one. one. Well, we wanted thank to you. thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. And, um, and that, that, that guy might just be filming, but he also might not agree. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but we definitely want to thank you for coming anyways because that's where it starts it starts with discussion it starts with listening and that's the only way that we can make change is by having these conversations and uh, we do really appreciate you coming thank you all right next question parkland so the governor of Kansas said that he is against one of the policy points stated in your website, raising the age for semi-automatic assault rifles from 18 to 21. He claims that those types of weapons are legitimate hunting weapons and that they need them. <laughs> and that they need them because Kansas has an epidemic with boars and they're destroying the crops, causing billions of dollars of damage. What do you say to that? Well, like I said before, I do believe that certain accommodations should exist for hunters. There's a large part of this country about which I was not aware before I started this work that where, where hunting is a very, very important part of their lifestyle. Hunting is how they feed their families. They hunt to defend their homes. And it is important not to, go, to, to keep those, those areas in consideration when we're forming these common sense gun laws. That being said, semi-automatic rifles Another show of hands. Who here knows someone 18 to 21 that they do not think is responsible enough to wield one of these weapons? <laughs> Everybody, the male brain is not fully developed until the age 25. Ask my girlfriend's mom. <laughs> and I believe that semi-automatic rifles do, are not require. do not, I've never hunted a boar before. But I believe that there are other weapons that can be used to hunt boar. Anybody? I actually read up on the wild boar issue where they bring in diseases and they've ruined the crop. They've cost the state 50 million in agriculture issues. I think that's terrible, but I also think that you should be 21 or over if you want to hunt the wild boar. <laughs> All right, next question. Okay, uh, this is the last question we have off our list, and it's directed towards the Chicago residents as well. Um, most murder cases in Chicago are never really solved. Do you think that adds to the continuing issue of violence? Uh, well, first off, I want to say with Chicago, 
as um, Anthony and Ariane have alluded to, there's a lot of problems that have led to gun violence, whether it's our underfunded schools or our lack of jobs for guys with records or it's um, the, the lack of legislation for places around us, as well as the um, code of silence, as well as the lack of uh, effort from some of our forces uh, has led to the uh, unsolved cases. And in Chicago, there's a stat where only 17% of our homicide cases get solved. And Ariane gave you the number earlier, over 200 people have been killed just this year alone in Chicago, and only 17% of those cases are being solved. So if someone is out there taking a life or shooting at someone and no one is being convicted for it, you think, oh, well, I can just go out there and do it again because no one's going to catch me for it. And that problem stems from uh, the lack of the communication from the community because many people sometimes are scared that, oh, they'll come after me, someone will come after me if I speak up. But the difference is if one person speaks up, maybe they'll be worried. But if the entire community speaks up, you can't be worried because they can't come after everybody. And as well as on the police's side of this, um, there was an ATF agent that was uh, shot and killed in Chicago. And police love to say, oh, we don't have the resources, we can't uh, solve your cases. But with the ATF agent, they solved that case within the same week. They found the killer, they went through doors, and they got to the killer. So in Chicago, in order for the cases to be solved, all the issues have to be tackled. But we need community relations as well as we need the police to step up and actually care about our cases and try to save lives. All right. Now we're going to open the floor to audience questions. Very briefly, before we do, I'd like to remind everybody, again, if you'd like to donate to a local charity called Aim for Peace, our merch is all the proceeds, 100% are going to Aim for Peace. <laughs> Thank you. And also, again, if you like the work and the conversation that we're attempting to have with everybody here today, please text CHANGE at 9779. Nine. Seven, 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 nine. Three sevens, my bad. So many sevens. All right. Um, so, for the questions, if any audience member would like to line up down the middle, uh, that is how we will be taking the questions. Uh, and if any um, of our disabled audience members have a question, just stay put, raise your hand. We will obviously take care of you. There was no normal. So I recently graduated from a university in the Deep South. Great university, great people, but you know, a lot of conflicting ideals. And one thing that they always say to me is, that's great you want to change gun laws, but isn't the majority of the problem with illegal guns? So why, you know, and I was just hoping that you guys could give me something to say back to that, because I'm looking for the answer. Well, first of all, thank you for that question. A there are a couple answers to that. First of all, with the expansion of universal background checks and private sales, which can, which can stop a lot of guns from illegally being purchased, pe people will say that bad guys will still have a chance to get guns. And the nasty, filthy, depressing rhetoric behind that is that if we can't stop all illegal gun sales, we shouldn't even try to stop any. That bothers me. Another thing is that people, people will talk about a lot of illegal gun sales being traced back to the criminals, but Criminals don't manufacture guns. And more and more guns are being legally manufactured and being pumped out. And like our friends from Chicago discussed, they are being legally purchased in bulk and then illegally sold. If we're not going to stop them at their source, well, certain, so if we're not going to stop certain guns at their source, they will continue to be illegally sold and there will be more and more out there on the market. Uh, just, I, I just want to add to that just super quick. Uh, just one, one problem that also exists is that with gun manufacturers, they are allowed to choose who they sell to, and we as a people are not allowed to hold them accountable because through the court system, it is illegal to have a class action suit against the gun manufacturers for any issues of liability, and that is a problem that we have to fix as well, but uh, just in general that they have, they have the choice to sell to these people, these licensed dealers who are giving away these guns illegally, and they may make that active choice just to get money, and it's just that they choose money over people, and we just have to choose people first.
This one is directed towards the, I'm Kobe. Um, this one di directed towards the Kansians, or Kansas, have you said. Um, would this be the last time uh, being in contact with students from St. Louis or students from Chicago after the parking students leave? No way. Uh, okay, I, I don't know if you guys know this, but um, we, we were here and we were all so nervous about meeting you guys, but once you came in, you, we shook hands and boom, like we just connected. It was amazing. Um, these kids, we all have the same cause and in talking to each other, we find that our cities are facing the same problems. Um, it's just in different geographies. And so we found that, you know, in working together and really creating this network across America, we can really bring change um, going from grassroots all the way to national. So this is definitely not the last time we're gonna be talking to each other and really working together. Um, in the future, I can definitely see, you know, collaboration and really just continuing this movement. Hi, uh, my name is Angelo Pacheco. I, uh, I just want to add, uh, first I want to say uh, the tragedy that happened at Parkland. Sorry you guys had to endure that. And uh, I, like any of my peers, don't want that to happen again. And I never want to. And I'm on, I'm on the Republican side. I've worked for various campaigns. and. I'm the one that raised my hand. I, I agree with the mass majority of, of the road to change and march for our lives. I agree with it. But a couple of things I don't agree with and I want to just clear up on is uh, what would happen after the banning of semi-automatic assault rifles? That's a slippery slope in terms of, well, the criminals are going to go on to the next thing, into the next gun, until you keep banning more guns and more guns, until you have like London, which has a higher murder rate by knives than New York with, and they have the strictest gun laws, they ban pistols. I just, I just don't, don't want that to happen. I don't want to be keep being disarmed, because I, I own an AR-15. Okay, it's locked up. I, I'm a responsible gun owner. Uh, but I just want to know your opinion on that. I just wanted to say that uh, the argument with knives is that a, a knife is not going to kill 17 people in six minutes. <laughs> First of all, I completely understand. I look at the knife problem in London, and I see a lot of other problems in how London is governed. I, I personally am not very good with European government. I think it's very complicated. Uh, Alfonso could tell you about that. But I'm European. I, 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 I understand <laughs> the slippery slope issue because it brings up the very legitimate concern. Let's say we get these semi-automatic rifles off the market, then then there are some shootings with 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 handguns with. With, with smaller weapons, what, what are people going to do then? I, I say this, I say that there are weapons that have been restricted before and the United States freedom has been perfectly maintained ever since then. I think that people are not able to walk around the streets with Tommy guns, with grenades, and hold on, hold on. Um, I understand the slippery slope, but I believe that as long as we continue to vote in this country, as long as we continue to keep morally just leaders in office, as long as we don't have a one-party rule with only Democrats or only Republicans, as long as there's an open conversation with people from both sides, I don't think anybody in this room, not, no matter what party you're in, wants only your party in office. I think that's dangerous. I think as long as the American people continue to make your voices heard, continue to express our democracy and have leaders in office who will protect us, we will not have to deal with that issue with them coming for the next guns and the next guns and the next guns. But again, thank you very much for asking. Um, and, uh, um, and again, I really want to thank, we really want to thank you for coming here. You're the dissenting voice in the audience and that takes courage. Um, and we really want to open it up so it's... And you know, one thing that like many people say is that our country is so divided, but like, you coming here, that shows that we can really start creating these bridges and it's possible. Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. Someone asked him, thank you for stepping I mean, up. You said you're here. But um, you know, about your slippery slope argument, that's actually a logical fallacy. It's um, one of 33 um, that we are taught in AP language. Um, it is what was used against the LGBTQ community in their gay rights campaign. Um, and it is, is incorrect. Um, and to me, about AR-15s, I don't see their practical use in America. I don't see their practical use in civilian life. Um, it's really not practical in defense of your home. 
and it actually can't be used in hunting um, because as my father said, the AR-15 bullet tumbles and its um, purpose is to destroy the object in which it's aimed at. So it really doesn't make sense for you to use it in hunting. Um, sure, you can use it as a recreation device, but again, you know, that might just be, have, be one sacrifice that you have to make in order to save lives. Thank you, ma'am. By the way, uh, I'm just a moderator, but I want to say, you know, I've spoken to a lot of Democrats and Republicans. It doesn't matter what party you're in, we're all still people. I, I just want people to know, just because somebody disagrees with you, it doesn't mean they're crazy. It doesn't mean that they're, you know, insane or that they see the world in a completely different way. You know, the way people grow up is, it, it really shapes their views. So I think having conversations from people who grew up in different places is the way we gotta move forward. So I, I really just want to say thank you. Jansen and I live in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, <laughs> um, so, so often what happens when kids like us try to talk to government officials about you know, gun policy reform is that we can only do one thing at a time. So when it comes from you know, the bill that died on reforming the National Instant Criminal Background Search or the NICS Index or federalizing and universalizing background checks, should we focus more on doing it you know, one step at a time, or can we do both at once? Should we work with our officials to be able to you know, make those bigger policy changes versus you know, focusing on the emotional you know, flare and glare that happens surrounding the gun debate? I think we've waited long enough, and I don't think we should be appeasing and trying to make our politicians comfortable. Um, their job is to represent us. And if they don't represent us, then they can just get out of office. We will vote them out. Um, in terms of pursuing policy, um, my thing is that I, we, uh, Taylor and I, we talked to our representative, uh, Kevin Yoder, or we had a discussion with other people and he just um, sat there on the side. <laughs> <coughs> That's true. That's true. The point is, uh, we tried to bring up so many points. We tried to, you know, shift the conversation to things that actually matter, you know, uh, talking about how's he going to vote on upcoming um, gun legislation. And these are things that you just need to pressure them on. So, in my opinion, I say it's okay to go for more, more than one at a time. You know, we've waited long enough. Mass shootings have, uh, I've grown up with mass shootings 17 years of my life. That's far too many. You know, go ahead, push for both of them. Push for three of them. It's time. We have to make this happen or else we're going to keep making this incremental change and making excuses for politicians to act slower and slower. It's their time to actually do their job. Uh, I just wanted to answer that one, too. Um, well, I didn't mention this earlier, but my brother, Terrell Bosley, April 4th, 2006, he was murdered uh, at a church. And since 2006, in Chicago and other places like Chicago, uh, in Chicago specifically, there have been more than 5,900 people shot and killed since 2006. And when we talk to politicians and we tell them we need this and this and this to change, um, there's so many different factors that play, uh, play a part in gun violence. And, at this point, we can't continue to wait any longer because that's the next doctor, that's the next lawyer that is going to probably lose their life because we wanted to wait because we want to make our politicians comfortable. So at this point in time, it's time to move. If we need things passed, immediately we have to fight for it. And if they don't want to listen to us, we just have to vote them out. was living in Las Vegas during October 1 and um, I wasn't there I was living two blocks away at the university but um, that has like since even though it's been just over half a year it's already not being talked about anymore so how do we like keep this entire movement from being forgotten about Uh, vote says a lot. Uh, yeah. the vote, the vote says a lot. Um, but we can't fall into this, this thing of letting it become the norm. This conversation of just saving lives should not be a conversation. So that's why it's so important to vote, but not just vote. Vote for the right people that will represent you. As I said earlier, if they're taking millions of dollars, thousands of dollars from pe people that don't look like you or come from where you come from, they cannot represent you. So stop letting these things become the norm. Because once we, they become the norm, we stop asking questions about it. We stop 
questioning like, whoa, is it okay for 57 people enjoying themselves at a concert to be killed or 17 students in Florida to be killed on Valentine's Day or kids in Chicago like Trey's brother who want to play the bass at a church to get killed? We cannot let that be the norm. So again, and I'm, I'm sorry you had to endure something like that. As Americans, we should be ashamed that we live in a country that has allowed that to happen. And on behalf, I send my, my love to you and Godspeed. I, I, was, I was born after Columbine, which is kind of a scary thought for a lot of people in this room, I bet. Um, and during the shooting at my school, when some of my dearest friends and I were locked in a room together, the scariest feeling I didn't feel, uh, the scariest feeling I felt was not the fear that I would lose my life. It was not the, the confusion. The, the most terrifying feeling that I felt was that I knew what was happening. It was a mass school shooting. We had seen these. Not only had we seen mass school shootings, we had seen mass shootings. M my, people in my generation, we grew up on them. And I think, uh, it hurts. It hurts, but I think it's different now. I think the movement's different. I think that a lot of people are now seeing enough of the patterns, and it should have happened a long time ago, back when people thought Columbine was an anomaly, back when people thought Sandy Hook was the price of our freedom, when, when students being executed in school, people being shot while trying to watch a Batman movie, when everybody thought that was just a, a slip up. I know it's weird to say that enough is enough can be real, but I think a lot of factors have come in, but I think it's real. I think a lot of people don't like to talk about Las Vegas because a lot of politicians don't have something to hide with. A lot of people like to talk about Stoneman Douglas because the politicians taking money from the NRA can say that we need to strengthen schools, can say we need armed guards in schools. They can talk about school safety. They can blame the, the cowards of Broward. But there was nothing besides these policy points they could have done to stop the Las Vegas shooter. The Las Vegas shooter would have passed any mental health test. I think the world has now opened its eyes and seen young people in, around the country rise up and say, we demand more of our country because our country is a country where it's our job to demand more. As American citizens, we need to get out there and say to our politicians, we don't work for you, you work for us. We are sitting here, we are holding you accountable and we are demanding we look in the mirror and say, how can we do better? Hi, my name is Gary Enrique Bradley Lopez. And I guess the question that I want to head towards is, why does it always feel that when it comes to gun um, control or gun safety or any type of gun concern, that it becomes type of, some type of a race issue? As in for sometimes it leans towards communities of color that get the blame for it. Or sometimes even when gun control or gun safety or gun issues do happen, um, as far as like a school shooting, why is it that the communities of color never get that attention until school shootings or things like that happen? Or just how do, you, and I also want to ask the people of color, how do you feel when sometimes we get the blame or when we don't get the attention for it? Thank you. Um, man, that's a, that's a deep question and um, I appreciate it because it's something that I actually uh, constantly think about. Uh, for me, um, it hurts because um, when you grow up in a community where somebody dies and it's like it's not on the news, it kind of become a norm for them where it's like nobody care. So um, when they happen to feel it and nobody cares, and they just keep doing it like, you know, nobody care about us. So when you come to them and be like, yo, we need to talk, we need to do this, and look what's going on in the world, they're like, they don't care about us. And so it, it makes it hard on uh, us to come to them with a voice of change. And I believe uh, with the Ferguson, what happened uh, with Michael Brown, uh, St. Louis is very segregated. And so what that did was, in the city of St. Louis, I don't know how it was for the media outside of St. Louis, but for St. Louis in itself, that caused like a big divide because we've seen it on the news where it was like, okay, this is real. We see separate parties, we see separate races going against each other saying, no, this is not gun violence, he did wrong or he was a thug, and it just brought a bigger gap. So I believe a reason why it, it, it caused for a race a divide is because when something happened to an uh, African-American, 
it's not publicized, you know, it's not talked about, it's not viewed as valuable, it's viewed as gun violence or gang activity, whether when it happens somewhere else, it's like, whoa, this is on the news, maybe because it doesn't happen often, is why they cover it, but we feel like we've been dealing with it for a long time, and so I believe that's why it could be a race issue a lot of times, because we don't get talked about, and I believe that's a very hard issue to deal with when you're going into communities. And so my thing is to just try to understand where both sides are coming from and understand like, why aren't you concerned with a nine-year-old getting killed just because it was quote unquote a drive-by? Like, it's a nine-year-old, you know, minding her own business in her home. And so I believe that that's, we can start with, for once, caring. It starts with caring first. Like, once you have a concern for somebody, like if you have a child and your child falls, the first concern is, like, oh, are you okay? You know, it's not, oh, okay, I'm playing a video game, whatever. Your child falls, you're like, oh, are you okay? You're checking up on her to see if she's okay. So I feel like it starts with caring. Um, caring for hum uh, humanities, caring for all humans. And so uh, after that, once you care, then you educate yourself on, okay? This is something you've been dealing with for years, that your people have been dealing with for years. How can I help? It's wanting to help, it's wanting to see change, it's loving. And so once we be compassionate, once we be understanding, and once we uh, be brave enough to have a voice, I believe that's when change will come, and that's when we'll see and be united. Once we unite and lock arms, is not a key in the world that can unlock it. Uh, hi guys, my name's Joey. I'm 17. I like Rachel. I'm from the Missouri side of Kansas City. Um, so my question to you guys is, um, a lot of older people kind of tell us since we're young, we don't really know any better. We don't know what we're talking about. Uh, it's kind of frustrating. What is kind of your response to that? Yeah, so again, Taylor and I have a lot of experience with this. Um, when we went to go meet Kevin Yoder, um, I mean, besides being 5'2", you get talked down to a lot. Um, just like, wow, you're doing such a great job. I hope you have a nice day. And they don't realize how serious you are. Um, when we had our talk with our own um, congressperson, um, the, our, the discussion kept shifting. They kept talking about, they kept deflecting issues. They kept talking about things that didn't matter. And then every time Taylor and I tried to shift the conversation, we need to talk about gun distribution. We need to talk about how racial communities are disproportionately affected. We need to talk about how LGBT communities are also disproportionately affected. They just shift away from that uh, discourse. And as a kid, it's really hard because, you know, we're still minors. Um, you know, we don't really have that range of motion. Um, one thing I felt really helpful is, you know, getting a support team that has adults. So um, some of the adults that helped us a lot today were uh, Jen Patel, so that's Quinn's mom, uh, Angela Walsh-Fisher, uh, Shabina. Uh, they have helped us so much today in organization and getting these adults on your side. Um, you know, they're, they're certainly not, um, you know, leading us to water or anything like that, but they are definitely our support system. So getting adults on your side, getting them to advocate for what you advocate for, you know, letting them amplify your voice when you can't do it yourself, I think that's really helpful. So finding supportive adults, um, people like that. I think that will really help your cause. Actually, I want to answer your question too. All right, I think that young people are the future. When people attempt to stifle their voices, they're scared. Mm -hmm. So definitely, people who talk down to you, treat you like your voice doesn't matter, that you're not knowledgeable on certain issues, are scared of you. And you should go ahead, keep pushing, keep getting involved in your community, Learn your rights, vote, use facts, tweet back at them, <laughs> show up at their office, call them, harass them. Don't harass them, but you know what I mean? <laughs> Get involved, because you matter, your voice matters no matter what your age, because one day you're gonna be a voter, you're gonna be writing on that ballot, and you're gonna be putting people in office. You may even be in office. Let's keep going. Can I answer real quick, just like one more comment? Can I, can I do like one little comment? Sorry. Um, Sorry, Alfonso. Um, all right. Um, the reason that they're you're talking. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, the reason that they're talking down to you because they know you're right. They do. Um, your our paradigm as a generation is completely different than the ones of our parents because we have grown up knowing only mass shootings. We have grown up knowing what it's like to go into these schools that are now fortresses because of this. And use that to your advantage. Use that that you have to go to school every day and that you're afraid because we truly are. We don't know who's next. And that's a constant question that we have to ask ourselves as kids. So use that to your advantage. Show them that you truly know what's going on because you've grown up with it. 
also wanted to um, piggyback on that. Um, how many of you went to the March for Our Lives Kansas City? Yeah. Woo! Thank you guys. So another thing that happened during the planning of this march was so many times us, we got, like during the planning of this event was, we got the question over and over, are you in charge? Can I talk to the person in charge? But you know what, we are the people in charge. And I completely agree with the, we are the future, but I think that we're also the now. Yeah. All right, because sadly this event does end at 7.30, we will keep the questions to two answers per question. Okay, guys? Okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sam, and um, first off, I'd like to emphasize how great this movement is, and I really respect it, and I'm happy to be a part of it. And I just want to say that, like, whenever I'm talking to my friends or, like, anybody about gun control, I always bring up the point that after the marches or, like, the rallies that our schools did individually, I always feel like that there have been more shootings after that. And I would just like to know, like, what's the prognosis? Like, what are we doing apart from having these meetings to better the community and to improve and make sure that this does not happen again? Because it's really scary knowing that maybe one day I might be locked in a room with my fellow classmates while there's a shooter out there just wanting to kill some of us. Thank you for asking that. I, I believe there are a couple things that are very simple. First of all, uh, this is my favorite thing to say. The best way to harness that beautiful energy that we see in these public displays is to take it to the polls and to vote. Because these public displays are us getting out there and saying we need this change. And the way to put this change on paper is to vote. Voting, uh, the, the midterm elections 2014 were the lowest attendance since World War II. We should be doing better every year. I think we're going to do a lot better this year. And I think that's a very, that's one of the strongest ways we can stop them. Also, one of the best ways we can attempt to continue stopping these shootings is to, fun, is to look into funding gun violence prevention programs, very often in a lot of different schools. For example, chicagostrong.org. They are very, they have a lot of effective student movements that will stop shootings in Chicago and have promoted these students bringing peace to their city. I want to speak to that as well. Um, well, which I've been a part of, like, as you said, Chicago Strong has two groups, the Brave and North Lawndale Peace Warriors. And we've been doing a lot of things for years, and we've just been trying to create change. And I think the main thing that we have to do as youth now is be prepared for radical change. Because I know just coming up July 7th, we'll be marching on the Dan Ryan Expressway in Chicago. So if we want to stop things, we got to take extreme change. So if that means shutting down something here, we have to do it. So. Yes. Hi. Um, I would like to thank all y'all for coming to Kansas, um, Kansas City, and um, discussing with us about gun violence. Um, my question is, how can more of us here in KCK get involved? Because I agree that um, what's here and what our economy grows up in shapes our environment and our future. And that's what I believe. So my question is, how can KCK get more involved? Um, so one thing is, uh, there is a Students Demand Action chapter for Kansas City. Um, the leader of the chapter is Daniela Rodriguez Chavez. If you want to meet me after the forum, I can totally give you her number, and she can definitely get you started in that. Um, another thing is, um, when it comes to doing uh, gun reform and gun violence prevention, it starts with policy. And policy is driven by politicians who are driven by public opinion. And we are that public, so we should start forming opinions. And those opinions come from facts, and those op uh, opinions come from attending town halls like this one. And so it's a really great thing that you're here now, and I'm really happy that you're here with us. I'm so glad that you made the decision to come here. Um, I think that getting involved this way is one of the best ways to do it because once you start spreading that to your friends, uh, spreading that to your family, that public opinion begins to change, and that change is going to help us for the better. I, I mean, just 
in, in general to really help out in your own area, like she said, just join up with local groups, local clubs that have already been doing this stuff. So, so many people have contacted uh, us and just like all our friends back in Parkland saying like, what could we do? And it's like, I'm in Omaha, I'm in Kansas City, I, I'm in Boise, Idaho, and like, and all these people are asking us for answers. And while we are flattered, we are not in your communities. We are not in your areas to be able to just go in and help at all times. And there are people on the ground in all cities, in all areas. There are violence prevention programs. There are charities that are doing great work in your cities that have been working for years and years before we even probably were born. And just, you can join up with these groups, you can join up with them, and just really help out on the ground in your community because that's where all of these things happen. That's where all of the change really takes place is on the ground in your own hometown. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kayleen. Um, I'm from Kansas City, Kansas. And uh, first and foremost, I would like to like thank you guys for being here. You included. <laughs> um, so, my question was, how do you guys feel about schools that don't discuss or, or like even acknowledge things that happen? Because in my school, while we as students might discuss it amongst ourselves, we get nothing about it, not even like, not, a teacher doesn't really say anything, it's not discussed, it's not an announcement, it's not nothing, so we just go home thinking it's sort of like a normal thing. I think the best thing you could do about that is have the conversation anyway. I think that to everybody in this room, if the conversation about gun violence in this country does not leave this room, if it stays in here tonight, you go home, and in the, future, in the near future you don't talk about it, we have failed you, and you have failed us. I think that the conversation comes with you. I think you can raise your hand and ask your teacher. You can ask your civics teacher to explain what happened. You can, you can bring these teachers, you can hold them accountable and make them talk about what's going on in this country. It's not against the rules. And if they don't answer, ask them again. I think another thing, you know, learn to disagree early. Um, that's a great thing about school. It allows us to make mistakes. It allows us to learn through them. And so in having these difficult discussions, you can grow as a person and you can be well prepared for the next one that happens. So, yeah. My name is Mary Martin, community activist here in Kansas City, Kansas. And Some of you know me, some of you don't, but I am so honored to have my youth here, my babies here, and I say babies because I consider myself as an elder. Anytime you lived as long as I am in the community as an activist, I'm considered as an elder, and I have grandkids as old as you guys, so you are my babies <laughs> and I appreciate you coming because you're standing up and you're speaking out and you're saying no more. We're not having it. us. There's a whole lot of elders out here that I know that feel encouraged by you just coming. So I want to give that to you. You know what I'm saying? You know, my brother said, am I done? And I'm like, I got elder rights. So I'm not done yet. You know, because I want you to hear this. Because I know you're going to Omaha, I know you're going across the country, and it's important. Because finally somebody is saying, no to power. And we need to understand that. Now look, my young brothers and sisters, for some of us that have walked that walk, I want y'all to keep walking that walk because the politics is not going to change. You know, all that you're going through, we have been through. 
And to see what we're dealing with, you know, is a shame. You know, it's, it's unacceptable. You know, I mean, it really is. You know, when we see babies dying and we don't have any legislation that speaks on it, you know, when we see babies being incarcerated and, you know, uh, behind census because they want to immigrate here, you know, now I didn't have that luxury, you know. My, keep, my people came by way of slavery and kidnapping, but I'm just saying that, you know, it takes somebody to help us in that struggle. So, to you, to you, I feel honored, and that's why I had to come, because I feel honored that you're here. I'm speaking true. I'm speaking true. Can I have a hug, you know? please? Uh, Is that what you want? Yes. I want a lot of things in the world. That's what I want. <laughs> trip to Europe together. I'll let you all know how that goes. Um, to everybody who had a question and was not able to get it an answered in time tonight, I'm going to stay on stage. Please come up and ask me. I'll, I'm happy to talk about it. And uh, fun. Absolutely. Well, we only have five minutes left in the program. I'm so sorry. I'm also sad. Don't worry. If you have any further questions, uh, most of the panelists will stay on stage to talk to any audience member because we believe having, you know, person-to-person -person interactions, whether they agree or disagree with us. But I'd also like to announce one more thing. March for Our Lives has decided that we're going to be donating $1,500 to Aim for Peace. I mean, we have to. Local charities are amazing. these happen. And with the, with the time left on stage, uh, if any of the panelists want to have a, you know, a closing, it's your time. My name is Rachel Gonzalez. I'm one of the organizers of this event. I just wanted to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for coming. I know we, uh, we told you guys just a few days ago about this event, but you guys really showed up and we, uh, we feel the love from Kansas City and thank you all so much. this at March for Our Lives, Kansas City, and I I've never been so proud of my city. Um, honestly, seeing you guys come together, um, it's phenomenal. It's awe-inspiring. And I promise you guys, just go home and ask yourself, why not Kansas? Why can't we be the beacon of hope? Why can't we be the change? Do that. Go out to your community. Spread the word, please. Thank you all so much for coming. All right, everybody, this concludes the program, but I have one last thing to say. Thank you, Kansas. We appreciate it. Oh, oh, also, hold on, hold on. Don't forget to vote. <laughs> and again, if you like what you saw today and you want to stay updated, please text CHANGE to 97779. <laughs>